Welcome back, guys, to another episode of the JWB Square, Scare, and Prayer segment, where we come in each week and give you players that you must start, players you can, should consider benching, and some flyers that you can look to at the end of your bench or maybe off the waiver wire in a pinch. But before we dive into today's players, let me roll the intro for you. Welcome. You're listening to JWB Fantasy Football. Thanks for listening. All right, guys. So we're going to start, as always, with our square section. Now, these are players that people might have genuine, legit concerns about putting in their lineup for various reasons, whether they're right on the barrier of a start line. Maybe they have injury concerns. Maybe there's rumors around them. And we're here to tell you that you got to stay chalk and they got to be in your lineup. So, Tim, who is the first player that should be in every single lineup this week? I'm going with Terry McLaurin. I'm back on the train. I'm going to say Terry McLaurin at ECR 36 is going to is going to surpass that, be a top 24 wide receiver this week. I understand he's had difficult weeks. I understand that Howell hasn't played that well like last week, um, and that Philadelphia's defense has been pretty good, but they haven't been that great against wide receivers. They did improve last week uh, when comparison to the year the weeks prior. Excuse me, with the performance against the Buccaneers, but they're still 23rd in points per game, averaging 28.6. So there are points available. And they are number one in rush defense, only averaging 6.6. So for Washington to stay in this game, it's going to require uh, them to throw the football because running the football this week is probably not going to be very successful. And even last week with Howell having the four interceptions, this was his least um, attempted game uh, against Buffalo. So we've even seen his pass volumes be higher. And I think that in a game against Philly, they're going to have to throw the ball. So we're going to see higher volumes. I understand that the average yards per game or yards per game total with Dotson and McLaurin is only 67.9 or 69.7 excuse me had that backwards so I know that they've been limited they've been capped but six for six on targets last week with Terry so he is he is involved um I think that as well that those that target number is going to have to be going or has going to be higher this week excuse me as well as he's going mostly against Bradbury and um uh Darius Slay and uh, QBRs for them is 115 and 95.9. So they are allowing catches. The catch rates aren't as high as, as you uh, like. They're around 55 and 65%. So um, it's not, you know, you're not getting 100 or an 80% catch rate. But I think that there is going to be work there. And I think that they're going to find more success outside just because of the fact that even we saw last week, they really bottled up Godwin. So even thinking that, well, Dawson's going to be the pressure release. I'm not really sure that that's, that's going to be the case this week, as well as Terry's around 24% first read. So I do like him to be uh, someone that they still look to get the, the ball quickly on first read targets. So I'm going to go with Terry's top 24 this week. I think it depends on the touchdown, but I think that he actually does get there this week because of the need to score points. Yeah, I like the call. And also, I mean, Terry and Dotson both find themselves under 10 yards per catch. So really, we, we got to hope that they open things up there. It just hasn't. Uh, I mean, last week, it just really wasn't working for him. Uh, and you were the Terry Whisperer last week, making a good call for him to be outside of uh, the top 36, and he came through for us. So I, I trust you there, Tim. I love Terry. It's just I hate rooting against him. But I think that this week is a good time to put him back in your lineups. All right. You heard it here, guys. Now I'm going to give you guys the next square player. It's going to be Tank Dell. I'm going to put him into my top 36. Now, ECR has him right at wide receiver 37. So it's not the boldest thing, but I want to give you guys a boat of confidence here for Tank Dell. Now, Tank Dell, he has the eighth most yards out of the slot in the league. Pittsburgh is fifth against wide receiver, fifth worst against wide receivers in terms of laying up fantasy points. And they've averaged 30 points allowed to the slot per game through three games. 30 points out of the slot. So they've been getting absolutely eviscerated there. Um, Dell's seen 18% of the team targets. They've thrown over 40 times per game. I don't think that there's really too much you have to overthink here. I know just because he's a rookie, you know, he's, he's a small player. And, um, you know, it's early in the season. You might not feel that confident yet on Tank Dell. You might still see him as a stash, but I think he's more than a stash, especially this week where he should be just a shoe in a lineup. So I think top 36 is pretty low. I'm really hoping he goes higher. And after after a couple of tough weeks for me here, I, this is a play I feel really good about. Yeah, targets 4, 10, 7, compared to Nico, 11, 9, 3. So he is the target leader the last two weeks when he's gotten the, the place, as well as he had a touchdown called back and he got tackled on the one. So even his performances could be viewed in a much different light already compared to what they already are. Yeah. All right, guys, so now we're going to move on to 
our little accountability section. Before we move on, we just want to give full transparency every single week. Review last week, maybe talk a little bit about why they went wrong, maybe why some went right, and then we'll we'll lead it with a conversation going into our scare section. Uh, to review last week, it was another tough week. Tim has been solid, steady. He's not as good as he would like to be this year, but he's doing pretty good. I'm the one holding his back here. We were two and six last week. We really, I really missed. All of the plays is crazy. I mean, Bruce Hall just didn't come through. Madison had his first good game. Dallas's defense, I guess, just is not good anymore. Uh, Kendra Miller couldn't get things going for Tim. Kate Otten fizzled out, but Ferguson was 0.1 points off of top 12. So if you played Ferguson, you weren't really upset. It's 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 a miss on paper, but it's not a miss in our hearts. And then he hit, as we mentioned earlier, Terry uh, being outside of the marks we told you. And then Amari Cooper, he had top 14. He finished ninth. So um, I don't have a whole lot of conversations about those specific players because I think that um, pretty much there's not a whole lot of conversation around them. So I'm going to bring up a different player today, a guy we've talked about in weeks one and week two with Raheem Mostert. And Tim, I'm going to ask you, with Raheem Mostert, after the big game with the emergence of Devon A-Chain, are you finding yourself in on Raheem Mostert rest of season? Do you think Devon A-Chain works into his workload enough where you'd have concerns do you think he's a sell candidate? Are you going and trying to buy him off of the HN excitement? Where do you sit on Raheem Mostert and what are you doing rest of the season? I don't think I'm buying him I because th I think the, the market's going to be too hot to try to buy him. But I also don't think that in many cases you should be selling him. Even if you take out, if you give him a zero last week, he's still RB15 on the season. So there's been production there. I don't think that A-Chain can 100% take over. That was one of my main concerns when it came to A-Chain in the rookie draft was that how much does he get for work for work on a week-to-week -week basis? Now, against a Denver defense that basically didn't want to tackle anyone, um, it, I would just say he got the right amount of work, whatever the amount of work that was. But if you're looking to move him, I think it's easier to do so in a redraft league. Um, I might be targeting kind of receivers that have underperformed, maybe like um, either one of the Kirk or Ridley, maybe target Addison for uh, – and a, an end of season kind of jump or more of a progression. But I don't think that, I think those that have very solid wide receivers, it's going to be very difficult to be like, yeah, well, let me flip. You know, he's even, even though he's RB one right now, let me flip, flip RB one for, you know, wide receiver 14. I think that they're going to see through that move. So it's probably targeting a wide receiver two, wide receiver three, if that's what you're looking for. But then you have to go back to the fact that we're all about scoring points. So, it's really difficult to be like, yeah, I'm just going to trade with number one point score away because of the fact he might get hurt, which we understand. It's it's possible. It's likely. But you kind of want to ride the hot train because the the there's only, what, 17 weeks in the season. So there's not that many instances in which you're able to, one, locate another running back and then find success with him every week. So he's probably more of a hold. But if you're looking to kind of diverse at a different position where you have running backs, I'd probably target an underperforming wide receiver that we know gets the target share and has upside. I'm not going for someone that averages under five targets a game. I want at least six to seven, if not more. But at this point, I, I, I'm more, more or less leaning to hold them. Yeah, I think that it's really difficult to get a trade done, right? Because if you send offers out for, you know, your CD Lambs, DK Metcalfs, you're probably getting laughed off, right? They're probably not making those deals done. And going after somebody like Garrett Wilson, it just carries a whole lot of risk in and of itself. Um, and it makes sense, maybe like what Tim was saying, if you, if Moser is excess on your team, which is tough to say because he's the RB one on the season. But if you know you have two other loaded backs, or you took or he Moser late, and you're trying to cash up before maybe a potential injury or what else, I, I don't see a huge, I don't take huge issue with moving for the Michael Pittman, Amari Cooper, even you know Jordan Addison. It really depends. That context is really going to matter. The, what your league is, if it's full PPR, three wide receivers, two flexes. It really depends on your setting. But in a lot of your shallower lineups, it's just hard to move on from Mostert right now and get what is equal in terms of what he's scoring into your lineups currently. So yeah. I understand both both parts there. I think a lot of context matters. And if you guys want to jump down in the comments and let us know offers maybe you've been sent or offers you're thinking about sending, maybe we'll, we'll give our opinion on those. Well, and I even, I even tried to like cultivate some sort of tight end trade. So the guy I fell to was Waller, but the thing with Waller is he's, if you're even comparing points, right? It's just not even in the same atmosphere. So like you're like trying to maybe, you know, play off the fact that uh, in your head, most are, is just, he's never going to be the same guy that he has been the first three weeks. But I mean, I'm going to ride that out as much as possible until it's mm -hmm. just not. So, yeah, I agree. Set us up good for the end of season. I mean, like you're not going to get TJ Hawkinson, Travis Kelsey, um, Mark Andrews. You're just not going to get those done. And at this point, like, 
is it worth moving for Sam Laporte? Again, we're talking the tight end position. And even then, I don't know how the Sam Laporte manager feels with how strong his start has been. So it's an interesting one, guys. And if you want, again, we mentioned the comments. Also, you can jump on our Discord link. It's in the description. Uh, it's totally free. Conversations going all the time. So jump in there. Again, our Redraft channel. Pop some trades in there. Maybe we can help cultivate one if you give a couple screenshots and lead context in there, too. We can do a little bit more in there than we can in the comments here. But those will work, too. Comments help us an absolute ton on these videos so we appreciate you guys but we're going to keep things moving we're going to get into our scares for the week now our scares are players that you should consider benching we're not saying do not start these players right last week even though i missed on alexander madison and james connor i had said guys they're both in these here top 24 plays i'm calling for them to potentially land outside the top 24 but there's a good chance especially with all these injuries you might not have another option if that's the case i'm not going to tell you to try to force kendra miller even though i liked him i wasn't going to try it to tell you to force Kendra Mailer in over James Conner. So that's just kind of the context you need to take here. We're not telling you you absolutely need to get these guys out. We're just telling you if you have equal or close options, you should go away from these players because we have legitimate concerns about their matchups this week or their ability to score points. So with that being said, Tim, give us a player that you are scared about for week four. Uh, we just talked about Tank Dell, but I, I think Nico Collins is someone that I'm going to kind of lean away out from this week he's ecr 33 and i actually uh, my statement is that he's going to be outside top 48 i just think that this is a tank dell week i don't really trust that pittsburgh is going to be the team that they're going to allow points to the outside um nico collins is, nico collins is excuse me snap share has gone down uh weekly and his highest was 70 percent. so it's not even like an alpha lead 1a target type wide receiver six uh 15.6 percent target share he's not even number one first read on his offense uh, in the receiving game. So there's a lot of things going on here, as well as if we want to talk about the picks for defense. You talked about them allowing 30 points a game to wide receivers in, in the slot or in you know interior targets. They're 27th at 33.4 on the season for total points allowed to wide receivers. So they're not allowing much outside. I understand that like Patrick Peterson's kind of more name right now than he is actually substance, but still um, as we're seeing just based on the performance of the defense that they're really not allowing that much, that much outside. So I think that this could be one of CJ Stroud's first, like true, like under pressure games that we see a little bit of rookie quarterback stuff. And I think it still plays better to the, the tank Dell targets this week, which is a reason why I really do like the call of him being in your lineups. But yeah, Nico's a guy I'm just kind of going to lean away from. Pittsburgh third in team sack percentage, and they're first in the league at 4.3 sacks per game. So I think they get a lot of pressure on Stroud this week, and Stroud gets the ball up pretty quick. And it's not going to be a time in which they're going to be throwing jump balls up to Nico. Yeah, I mean, it might be name recognition, but I don't think that like Mika Fitzpatrick and Patrick Peterson are like slumps by any means. And with the way they're getting to the quarter right now, they got to get the ball quick. And maybe that's why the slot is being favored. So it's a bold call outside the top 48. I mean, one big one big catch ruins that day. But I am here with Tim and his conviction. And who am I after my start to the season here for you guys? Now, last year, guys, we hit on 69% of our calls. So please, I know we are making fun of ourselves for a few of these misses, but we really hope to turn things around like we did last year. We got hot in in the middle of last season and hopefully that can start at any point here i feel really good about my place for this week and i feel really good about my scare here i'm going with joe burrow who i've been below consensus on every single week and it's worked out for me every single week in my rankings um joe burrow i have him outside the top 12 which i don't think is that bull but ecr has him at quarterback nine top 12 just means he's outside of your one quarterback lineups which i think is completely fair until i see it from joe burrow for the rest of the season i just don't want anything to do with him in my lineups this injury is obviously holding him back um, significantly. So Joe Burrow, 55% completes percentage, and he's only been pressured at the 25th rate in the NFL. So it's not even like he's gotten, getting guys in his face or like his line is completely falling apart. He's just simply not hitting his marks. 55% is 35th in the NFL. The only two quarterbacks who are below him are Jordan Love and Zach Wilson. It's not exactly great company. Now he has a 1.7% touchdown rate on the sixth most passing attempts into the league. That's just not going to get it done for fantasy. And he has no rushing. So he's 29th in attempts and he's 32nd in yards per carry. And that's a big part of his game. You know, 75 rushing attempts last year, a couple of five rushing touchdowns. And that was a big difference from what we got two years ago versus last year in his end of season finish. Um, and he's not giving that for you now. And those extra two points a game are the difference between, you know, potentially being quarterback 15 and being quarterback 24. So it does make a big difference there. Now the matchup on paper, like Tennessee's not the, the, the hardest matchup. It's not an exactly a tough matchup here for quarterbacks. They're 23rd versus quarterbacks. Um, and they're very vulnerable to wide receivers over the last this year, thus far. And over last year, they were arguably the worst against wide receivers here, but, 
if Burrow's less than 100%, it could just be a rough day for him and Mixon, right? The one thing with Tennessee is their run defense is very, very solid. So if Mixon's getting stuffed and Joe Burrow is just not hitting his guys, it could just be a, a bad day for Cincinnati. Um, and it's really tough for you know T. Higgins owners to try to figure out when that consistency is coming because uh, in a game like this, I could see a world where T. Higgins just – kind of gets fizzled out i think jamar chase is going to get fed enough and it's just good enough to be an impact player no matter how the game script grows but this is one where i think a lot of people are getting ahead of themselves with tennessee thinking well they're terrible against wide receivers and they're they're you know 10th worst against quarterbacks so this might be the get right game here for joe burrow but i don't think the get right game comes until we hear that he's 100 percent. and we don't you don't have that right now he was 100 percent at practice today but it was a walkthrough like they didn't go out and they weren't doing full drills and i just don't have confidence until i see it with joe burrow honestly they should have just started the year with him on ir like they're one like they could they might be one and three after this week or they're one and two to start you could have been one and two with browning to be honest um so i just would have rather joe burrow come into the season 100 percent. but here we are i agree and even if you look at that tight i had tennessee at 21st in points per game at 19 and a half so i think we might be somewhere close but even if you do 23rd right based on averages that's the 10th best quarterback on the week. So that might be you know, your best case. And as we know, uh, with Burrow not being healthy, I think that there's a lot lower ceiling as well as that offensive line hasn't played great. And they're dead last in yards per game. So there's a lot going on here. I think Tennessee's a good a good matchup for the wide receivers, but that means the wide receivers can score a bunch of points even just on receptions and not score a bunch of touchdowns, especially if Burrow can't get them into the red zone. Yep, that's the big part. They're going to need a score for Burrow to really get it done. So... We're going to get going to the last section of the day, guys, is our prayer section. This is the fun section. These are our flyers. These are guys who maybe are sitting on the end of your bench, or maybe they're at the top of your waiver wire, and we're here to tell you that you can slide them into your lineup in a pinch or in your deeper leagues. You should feel good about having them in because they have some upside this week. So, Tim, who is the first player you're taking a flyer on this week? Yeah, this is going to be a pretty big prayer, and it's not based on ECR, but it's based on the conditions of the team and you know the information surrounding it. I'm going with Dalton Kincaid this week, ECR 15. I'm going to say he's top 12. I think it's a special case because they're playing Miami, 53 and a half over under. I think there's going to be opportunity for points here. Something very interesting about the Miami defense is that they're they're bottom 10 in receptions allowed to wide receivers, but they're only 11th. They're 11th in points per game allowed to wide receivers. So it's a very touchdown based stat. As we get more and more data, more and more data points per week, I think those things will even out a little bit. But they're only averaging 0.3 touchdowns allowed to the wide receiver position per week, and then 0.7 uh, to the tight end with five receptions, which means on this, they're 24th in points allowed with 8.8. Um, the real question is going to be, is to, does Kincaid get the snaps? Now, we've seen both Kincaid and Knox, their snap uh, rates have dropped every single week. Now, Knox has always been like one or two percentage points in terms of snap percentage above Kincaid. But in this game, I believe that there's going to be a need for the receiving offense to really play a big role, especially if Miami's putting up points. And I think that Kincaid's in a much better uh, situation to do so compared to Knox, where Knox really operates more on the sideline or more on broken plays, where Kincaid can really be schemed up as a slot player. And we know that slot receptions are very valuable, especially in today's league. So I'm going to go out on a little bit of a limb here with Kincaid. He could absolutely bomb. But I think that with the 53 and a half point total, he's a guy I want to take the risk on for upside because, yeah, I, even, with, even with Ferguson last week, right, he was like 0.1 off, but you're right around 10 points. And I think that if Kincaid has a game this week, he could be, you know, he could be double digit, like 17, 18 points, especially if he gets a touchdown, if this if this game goes over. And I think that there's a very good chance it does. I like it. Um I have Dalton Kincaid at 12 in my rankings, despite why and Tyler currently have him at 17. So I am ahead of the pack for this week, despite I've had Dalton Kincaid around 18 or further out every single week. I know early season, there was a lot more hype with him, where at the end of the day, guys, it's still a rookie tight end when you see how he's worked in. Um, but I do like this matchup a lot, right? With Miami, you never exactly know what you're going to get. Um, their defense is no slouch, but also, you know, they've been vulnerable at points. But one thing that stayed true all of last year and thus far this year is the tight end scores points against Miami. And so that's where I think that this is a good call. I think uh, this game could go a whole bunch of different ways, right, with, with Buffalo's defense being so solid against – quarterbacks and then they've had games this year where they've been great against wide receivers they had games this year where they were great against the, the run and then they've had games where they weren't great against the run like this could go all different different sort of ways right this thus far in the touch this year for touchdowns the average in the nfl is seven touchdowns per game buffalo has 10 miami has 17 that's the first and second 
most scoring teams in the league right now. So you have the two highest scoring teams thus far, at least in t- terms of touchdowns facing up. I mean, there could be points all over the place or it could be a, you know, hard nosed divisional matchup. Either way, if there's one player, I'm going to one position I'm going to bank on. It's going to be the tight end group. Let's just hope it's not a Dawson Knox touchdown where he leaks out on the goal line because uh, that could also happen. But I like the call. Yeah, this could absolutely bottom out. I'm not I'm not at all um, a stroke swing away from that or string away from that. I just think that the upside's so good where because you said we don't know exactly what this game's going to be. So I would rather lean into it than lean out of it because there's a lot worse games that we could lead into that oh, you yeah. know, you, your ceiling is nowhere near this. 100%. All right, guys, my prayer player for the day here is going to be Roshan Johnson. I'm going to have him finish top 30. He's running back 33 currently in ECR. Uh, I think, obviously, Javante Williams is the running back in this matchup. That's just an absolute smash in terms of a guy I want to play. But I think Roshan's kind of the sneaky option here that's sitting on a lot of people's benches. Um it's the bottom two running defenses we have here. I mean, did Denver just let up 70 points, a hundred fantasy points to running backs last week. Um, so obviously there's that narrative, but on the other side of the ball, Chicago is also the, the worst or the second worst uh, against running backs. So this could just be a frenzy all around. Roshan Johnson has been the most efficient back, uh, most effective back in my opinion on the Chicago bears here. He's very close around 50% of the snaps, but just six snaps here behind um, Khalil Herbert thus far into the season, but he has 41% more points on those six less snaps. Now, if one running back from this group is ever going to separate themselves, it's going to be Roshan Johnson because he's the guy who really leads the way here in both his blocking and his receiving. There's a reason that David Montgomery got so much work last year, and despite Khalil Herbert being over five yards per carry in his career, there's a reason he couldn't pass snaps over for David Montgomery. It's because David Montgomery is an elite pass blocker. We see in Detroit. That's why he's getting so many snaps in Detroit. He can give it to you on the he can get you a touchdown on the goal line. He can block for you between the 20s. That's a very valuable player. I'm sorry that it doesn't always give you fantasy points when you have these young, exciting players behind him, but he's good at football. And I think that's what we might end up getting a little bit from Roshan Johnson here. It's just he's a well-rounded football player, and he might be somebody who gets continuously worked in more and more as Khalil Herbert just doesn't get the job done on that front. So if we're talking about the running back here that's going to be getting the receiving work, might be the one to go over 50% of the snaps over Khalil Herbert more uh, I mean, sooner rather than later, he's the guy here that I want to target. He's also caught 91% of the balls that's thrown his way. So he's more than capable uh, of getting the balls when they're dumped his way. Um, he's the only running back on the team with a rushing touchdown. I think this is a good spot just in general for the run game to get back on track here for Chicago, which should be the strength of their offense. Um, and for that reason, I think Roshan Johnson is completely viable uh, are we two in an absolute pinch but for your leagues where you have a uh, flex spot i think he's a consideration and in leagues where you have three wide receivers and one or two flex spots i think he's definitely somebody i'm sneaking into my lineups i like the call even if you look at the 30 they're, they're 32nd with 45.9 points allowed per game after the three weeks you go back to even weeks one and two they were 22nd allowing 20 points per game so they still were bad even before this miami game yeah All right, Tim. So we got a little bonus, one extra prayer this week. I'm sticking away from bonuses because my bonuses thus far this season have both missed. So Tim, give us a little bonus play for the week. I like Jordan Addison this week. Uh, He didn't get a touchdown last week, but the first two weeks he was uh, one to score a touchdown. And I think that um, actually just a little bit more about, about Addison, you know, increased target share or snap share every week. He's averaging six targets per game. So it's been consistent work every single week, but I think that we're looking at kind of a, um, a fake performance in terms of the defense of Carolina. They're 17.7 points per game, which is fifth um, points per game allowed to wide receivers and only 10 receptions a game. Excuse me, I can't talk. But they played the Saints, Falcons, and Seahawks, right? Now, if we want to look at total yards allowed in each of those games, the only team that didn't outproduce or didn't outproduce or produce close to their average was the Falcons. The Saints were within five of their average and the Seahawks were way above their average by like 150. 50, I think. And the last two games have been 383 yards allowed on average, almost 400 per game to, to the last two opponents. And Minnesota's eighth in yards per game and their second in passing yards. So I think Minnesota's really going to dictate this game. And I don't think Carolina is going to be able to do anything about it. I think that the Carolina's going to have to fall in place because it looks like Carolina was placed down to their competition. And with them uh, pretty much not being a good team all season, they're going to be playing catch up in this game. And I think that part of the reason is because Jordan Addison is going to have a big game. And I think a lot of it's actually going to come early because of Carolina wanting to play slow and then 
Minnesota wanting to make a statement after sharing 0-3 and kind of giving that game away last week, that I think they're going to come out throwing, and I think that they're going to be very aggressive to start the game. No, I, I like the call. I really like the receiving options for Minnesota just in general. I mean, Jordan Addison, T. Hawkinson, obviously Justin Jefferson. It's going to be tough for me to have any of these guys out of my lineup pretty much ever, especially because of my lack of confidence in the run game. There's a reason Kirk Cousins is throwing the ball so much. There's a reason he leads the league in passing yards. And number Jordan one Addison, in fantasy. Yeah, and number one in fantasy. Position. Exactly. There's a reason why Jordan Addison here is going to be a main beneficiary of that game plan. And as the season goes, honestly, I'm liking the idea of Jordan Addison getting worked in progressively more. I don't know how that affects other options in the team like a TD Hoggs. And one thing I will say with KJ Osborne, who did get the touchdown last week and got a touchdown the week prior, is you're never really going to get more than three to six targets per game for KJ Osborne. He's going to catch maybe one to four of them. Like that's kind of what we get from him. He'll make, he'll be the guy that gets completely lost in the back and has a walk-in touchdown when some suddenly nobody near him, but then he'll also have balls where he's all alone. You know, he's got five years of separation. He'll drop the ball. So he's, he's a very frustrating player. I think it's a clear talent gap between Jordan Addison and Katie Osborne and Katie Osborne gets a touchdown all alone. It's because of what Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison are doing. So I wouldn't be scared off by the touchdown last week going against him. If anything, I'd be really stoked that Addison has two through three games as a rookie. I think that's really positive signs. He's had the consistent targets that should should give you a top 30, especially in a game, as you mentioned, Tim, that is going to throw the ball so much. Uh, before we go, give me just a quick answer. If you had on your team, are you starting Jordan Addison or Adam Thielen? Oh, my God. I'm going Addison. I, I don't – I can't do the Thielen thing. He was so dead, dead last year. And I understand he's gotten so many targets, but he was your can favorite that really last year. He was your can favorite. Really, but can that really last? That's my question. Yeah, I, I, I hear you. I do like I do like him this week, but I thought I'd give you a fun little mm -hmm. one there because yeah. of all the narratives, of course, go well, around. And, and the Minnesota defense isn't good. It hasn't no. been good for a while. So it's possible. It's just, you know, I, I don't know how he even gets open anymore. Like, everyone should know his moves. He's never going to beat you deep. You should just sit on him all day. It's almost like they should just play the run instead of the pass and just let him Amen. run the seven-yard routes and then cut him off. Don't hate on the, the savvy veterans here. Um, but I think that does it for it this week, guys. We're going to get out of here. Um, if you enjoyed, please like and subscribe. Again, as we said, those likes and a comment goes so such a long way here for us. It helps us out so much. Um, in the description, you can find a bunch of good links. Uh, the Discord, where conversation is going nonstop. If you want as many as much in-depth responses as you would like for any single question, the patrons less than a dollar a week as, as, long, as well as the Clips catalog. Just like in this video, every player we talked about, I have individually clipped out every single player. You go into that catalog, you search out what player you want, depending if you want to know what we were saying about them coming into the season. You want to know what we were saying them week by week, and you want to know what we were saying about them for Dynasty. You're going to go in there. It's all very easily organized. You can find the player take that you want. Um, that being said, you can go find JW Fantasy Football on all platforms, but specifically on Twitter, at JW underscore FF. You will find the pin tweet with all of our team's information. So definitely go give everybody else a good follow here, and we will catch you guys next week.